Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this Palm Sunday and the opportunity we have to celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus, our King. Be with us during this time. Open our minds and our hearts to your truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. One of the things that I absolutely love about serving with you all down here in this space um, is Justin and the worship team. They do such an incredible job each and every week. Um, it's a real pleasure for us to um, worship with them and their leadership. Um, I love it because of that, but also because it reminds me of a really important time in my own Christian journey of formation. About 20 years ago, I was pretty involved in the Christian contemporary music culture. I, I went to a lot of concerts and shows and worship events, and I even had a little band that we played a few times together. I've mentioned this before, but it, it bears repeating. Uh, my Oma, my mother's mother, used to say that um, our brains are computers. Uh, you got to put information in in order to get it out later. So if you spend a lot of time out in nature, enjoying the beauty and wonder of God's creation, and then you find yourself in a stressful situation in your life, if you close your eyes, you can imagine yourself back in that place of peace and calm. If you spend daily time reading God's love letter to you and Holy Scripture in the Bible, that when the world begins to ridicule you, you can ignore that noise and remember and focus on the knowledge of God's love for you. I've prayed with dozens of people near death who have lost memory faculty, and it's amazing to me how often when we're praying or singing a hymn that those people who don't even know who's in the room with them can sing and pray along because of all of the time they spent during their childhood. So this week, while I have been contemplating our Lord's triumphant entry as king into Jerusalem, one of those songs came back to me. And I have not thought of this song in probably 15 years. About 20 years ago, a guy named um, Charlie Hall wrote a song called uh, King Eternal. And um, it was a pretty popular song in um, praise and worship circles, uh, Several bands picked it up right after that. And so I asked Justin if he would teach us that song today. Unto the King eternal Unto the Lord immortal, unto the God invisible, you alone are wise. All glory and honor forever to you, O God. All glory and honor forever to you, my King eternal. To you, my King eternal. Let's try that first verse together. Unto the King eternal. Unto the King eternal. Unto the Lord immortal, same melody. Unto the God invisible, you alone, you alone are wise. Let's sing that again. Unto the King eternal, unto the Lord immortal. Unto the God invisible, you alone are wise. All glory and honor forever to you, O God. All glory and honor forever to you, my King eternal, 
To you, my King. To you, my King. It's a Thank you so much, Justin. So now it's going to be stuck in your head for 20 years. <laughs> Today, Palm Sunday, is a day that we practice what we do so often also in the Eucharist, ritual anamnesis. We remember and we reenact the occasion of Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem as our king. The question that is before us today is that as Jesus enters into Jerusalem in a new and powerful way, how are we participating in that, and what does it mean for us in our lives? Imagine that you have been waiting your entire life for someone to show up. More than that, imagine that your parents and grandparents and generations before them have all been waiting with hopeful expectation that the one person will come and will free your people from centuries of oppression. The anticipation of the coming of the Messiah, God's chosen one to rescue the Jewish people from foreign oppressions has been building for decades and decades, for generations and generations, and during Jesus' public ministry, it becomes clear that he is indeed the Messiah. And so when Jesus enters into Jerusalem with shouts of, Hosanna, the processional crowd, we believe that he has come to set them free. All of the Holy Week events are couched in this political dynamic that someone has come to overthrow those who are in power. Both Rome and the Jewish leadership are afraid. They fear that they're going to lose their power. And as people who know we how this week ends, we know that Jesus' entry is costly. We know that he didn't overthrow the Roman government, but as the Messiah, he did so much more, not only for his people, but for all people and all creation. His messianic work was to save all of us from sin and from death. I think it's pretty difficult for us as Americans to imagine that we live under the rule of a king. Not only a king, but a king who should be honored and served we pride ourselves on our individualism. The history of Western expansion has shown that only the strong survive. But where's the good news in that? Almost 250 years ago, the early citizens of the colonies rejected the rule of a king. We can do better without one, they said. And so when we talk about Jesus as our king, we have some history and some personal bias to overcome. Jesus does represent for us a much better model of kingship than any human leader ever could. Kings before, during, and after Jesus' time were often military rulers who came into power by slaughtering lots of people. They certainly taxed those people and made servants do almost all of the work. But Jesus is different. Jesus is a servant king. He models for us that even though we ought to bow and scrape before him. He is the one who washes our feet and teaches each other that we should wash one another. That early Christological hymn that Paul writes down for us in Philippians, I think really summarizes how we should understand Jesus as a king. He says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not consider quality with God as something to be exploited but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus is our humble king. His burden is easy, and his yoke is light. Now for us today who call ourselves Christian, it's not really a question of I like this about our king, I'm not so sure about this, or I agree with him in this, but uh, he might have that one wrong. We do that with our current political leaders, but Jesus is the son of God, 
Unlike all human authority in our lives, elected or otherwise appointed, the love and the sacrifice that he's made for us has enabled us to not only become citizens of God's kingdom, but sons and daughters of God. As a pastor, as a preacher, and a teacher over the past few decades, I have become weary that many of us American Christians seem to value our own individualism and independence over following Jesus. I feel strongly that our primary identity, because of what God has done for us and what happens in our baptisms, is that we are children, beloved children of God, and followers of Jesus. In countless conversations, though, with people, it's been clear that people value being an American or a Texan or a Republican or a Democrat or in favor of this issue or that one over even following Jesus. So many of us get caught up in the falsehood that our lives, our fate, is dependent upon our political leaders. We support those who share the same views that we do, even if we disagree with everything else that they might say. And we root for those who support causes we oppose. We root for them to fail. One could make a case that the reason that Game of Thrones is such a popular television show and book series is because that the ruler is constantly being overthrown. (laughs) Now, some of you might say, sure, Eric, all this sounds fine, but get your head out of the clouds. We live in the real world. And that's exactly my point. This is not the real world. As followers of Jesus, we are just resident aliens here for a time, but ultimately... We belong to another kingdom. Remember Jesus' teaching. I'm going to read you a bit from the Sermon on the Mount here. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In a few minutes during the Eucharist, we will pray together words that Jesus taught his followers, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God, that God's kingdom may be on earth even as it is in heaven. Jesus is our king, but can we prioritize his lordship over our lives before all of these other parts of our identity? This week, we're going to have a lot of opportunities to fill our minds and our hearts with the beauty of the liturgy of God's love letter to us through all the readings of Holy Week. And I want to commend to you to participate as much as you are able in all of the services that we'll have here and in the readings. I particularly want to invite you to read through one of the four Gospels this week. I promise that if you do it, walking with Jesus through this journey of the week, through scripture, um, your life will be blessed through it. The anticipation and the preparation for coming next Sunday, for celebrating the resurrection, is made all the more special by spending that time with our Lord and King. This week we wait and we prepare for our King to come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Precious Lord Jesus, you are our king. Help us to put you and service of you above all other priorities in our lives. 
Help us to continue to cry, Hosanna, blessed are you, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for all the ways that you inspire us to follow you more closely. We pray that you would help us to be faithful to you during this holy week. In Christ's name, amen.